Hello and welcome to the next episode of Policy Wars. I am Ruti, joined by my colleague Ankit. The much-awaited Union Budget 23-24 is out, and as with most discussions in the country, there are both merits and demerits of the policies being discussed. There is a need to take a deeper look at the finances of the country and how it affects our individual lives. There is a sense of optimism in a growing economy like ours. Our revenues are rising, providing ample space for the governments to spend. However, there are concerns about increasing debts and deficits too. Where does the problem lie? To break it down, we have with us today Dr. JP. Welcome, Dr. JP. Thank you, Vritti. So let's address the elephant in the room first. There is an this is an election year with numerous states going in for elections, culminating into general elections in the early 2024. How would you rate the budget in that context? You are right. The context is very important. Uh, with many states going for elections this year and the parliament election itself due next year along with other states in any political democracy particularly in a poor country it's always tempting for the government to take the soft approach uh, the short term welfare dominating over the long term good uh, we have to examine the budget in that context i would say given the backdrop it's actually quite impressive quite impressive because the government very uncharacteristically in a democracy particularly in our country they have resisted the temptation to be a populist in the short term at the cost of the long term good there are of course huge fiscal compulsions because ultimately our resources are limited our wants are many and challenging uh, situation is how to match these both and yet give an impulse to growth under the circumstance i think that government of india and the finance minister done a very credible job and therefore if you have to have any rating for the budget i would rate it as a plus uh, in the narrow context of the government of india's account statement of accounts where ultimately the future cannot be determined by the budget alone we put too much hope in the budget we somehow think that the budget brings about a revolution budget is merely a statement of accounts of the union government it can allocate resources assign priorities and point to a direction of the future in that sense allocation of resources assigning priorities and pointing a direction of the future i think this budget has done remarkably well and we must compliment the finance minister while this is true that the government has given a sense of direction to the country and it has laid down the highest ever capital expenditure but what about the immediate needs of the citizens are they adequately addressed in the budget you are absolutely right in a poor country we have to address the immediate concerns at least reduce some of the tedium and the suffering of the poor on account of the burden of poverty and at the same time build the foundations for long term growth which gives jobs and therefore enhances incomes and therefore the only route to eliminating poverty and this balance is very tricky in a democracy the government is uh, at an advantage this position because over the past 6 7 years they have laid some strong foundations in the individual welfare measures you take a, a series of uh, areas for instance you take the lpg something like 9.6 crore people have been given lpgs and they're given the subsidy for utilization of the fuel some 48 crore janthan accounts are there and therefore impressively india is able to transfer the welfare amount to these people directly they are not done in this budget but there have been the cumulative impact of sensible decisions taken over the past and that's an important lesson there's no one time solution there has to be a foundation laid and perseverance and because of the perseverance and the foundations the government is now in a slightly better position we're always in a difficult position make no mistake about it because our resources are always short of our needs but within that the past fiscal prudence and laying the foundations help the government uh, similarly various kinds of insurance programs for the poor the life insurance accident insurance and so on and so forth some 44.6 crore individuals are covered by a variety of insurance programs and very low cost premiums and yet the people getting something in a moment of crisis in a moment of distress all this continuing the pm kisan which actually originated from telangana state in the form of raithu bandhu its variant is pm kisan it's reaching 11.4 crore uh, people uh, and then agricultural credit accent and cooperatives which are essentially the collectives of the small farmers in the country then certain initiatives in healthcare and skilling and housing they significantly increased the prime minister's avas yojana so they did make serious efforts 
to try and uh, enhance the allocations. Uh, but the advantage the government enjoys is that the quality of uh, expenditure over the past seven, eight years and the reach to the ordinary poor, particularly in states which were not known for good governance earlier, uh, the reach has improved significantly. And therefore, they're able to give some degree of satisfaction to the poor. Uh, and therefore, given the circumstances, without going uh, recklessly profligate, I think the government has done a pretty creditable job, even in terms of the short-term welfare. But more important is, are we going to alleviate the long-term poverty or not? For that, at least the foundations are laid. The budget cannot guarantee elimination of poverty. That ultimately all of us have to do. The states, primarily governance is in states. Most people are forgetting that. From infrastructure to education delivery to healthcare delivery to creating conditions for the poor to uh, come out of poverty, including rule of law. Most of these are state-level uh, governance issues. And of course, the entrepreneurs, they must rise to the occasion when the opportunity is given. Uh, they must invest, they must take the risks, and they must produce, and they must employ people and then generate incomes. Uh, government cannot guarantee it, but government can pave the way for that. In that sense, I think it's a, it's a sound budget. Sir, uh, let's talk about fiscal federalism and uh, how, how the budget has impacted fiscal federalism. The union government is going to transfer 18.62 lakh crores this year for the states. This will provide uh, fiscal room for the states to look, take care of their uh, the constituent the needs of the constituent electorate. But still we see that the states have deficits and it, in some cases it's increasing. How do you read these numbers? Ankit, poverty means lack of resources. If you're rich, you have surplus resources. If you're poor, you have shortage of resources. And poor countries are particularly handicapped because not only are you short in resources, but your need for resources is greater. You go to a rich country like Germany or Australia or United States or Britain, they've already built the infrastructure, they laid the foundations for a very viable and effective system. The third difference is the rich countries generally are also better governed, therefore, they're actually capable of delivery. Now, in a country like India, all these three are a problem. A, we are short of resources. B, our need for resources to build the country, the infrastructure and the services is very great compared to the other countries. And C, our capacity to actually deliver is not as good as it should be. Under the circumstances, every state in the union always feels the paucity of resources. So it's not a union issue or a state issue. States have their problems, but take the union's problems. Out of the 33.61 lakh crores of revenues union is generating, estimated to generate in 23 24, as you said, 18.63 lakh crores. And that comes to about 63 64 percent. 63 to 64% of the total revenues of government of India are transferred to states in some form or the other. There is no federal democracy in the world where such large-scale transfers take place. Therefore, without going into the politics of it, if you take over a long period of time, say 1970s onwards, our federalism actually has improved and matured. There is much greater predictability. Finance commissions have been acting with great transparency. And they've been extremely, um, uh, what shall I say, what's the right word to use? They've been extremely cognizant of the state's uh, needs because after all, states are where most of the key services are delivered for education, healthcare, rule of law, the three key services that the government should deliver. They're basically at the state level, including the basic communities like drinking water, electricity reaching the people, uh, stormwater drainage, sewerage system, and so on and so forth. Considering that, Acknowledging that the union government has been pretty generous over the years, not one party or uh, one term. And the finance commissions have been extremely practical. But we also must realize that the union government also needs resources. Because big infrastructure, for instance, this year, the capital expenditure of the union government is 13.47 lakh crores. About 10 lakh crores union government directly. About 1 lakh 30,000 crores they are transferring to state governments as interest-free loan so that they can be spent again on capital expenditure by the states and 2.4 lakh crores for the revenues. All these are required. We have to upgrade our, our uh, railways. We have to improve the infrastructure overall in the country because our infrastructure is decrepit uh, for a large and growing economy, the, the fifth largest today and third largest in terms of purchasing power. Our infrastructure is really abysmal. We must realize that. We, somehow many people think that we have already arrived and we are a rich country. No, we are a very, very poor country. Our infrastructure will go by global standards would rank at the bottom of the 49 large economies in the world along with Pakistan and Bangladesh and Nigeria. 
So we have a long way to go and that means investment. But along with investment, there must be capacity to, uh, to really deliver honestly and competently and swiftly. So states have a, some states have a problem, but states also are yielding to the temptation of being profligate for the short term electoral benefit. They are mortgaging the state's future. But some states are doing a remarkable job. Take a state like Orissa, a poor state traditionally, and therefore the per capita revenue mobilization is low, per capita income is low, and yet it is a model of fiscal rectitude. So this is what we have. How best you utilize the resources? That is the challenge. Each blaming the other, that will not really help us. So states are closer to the people. And like you said, uh, the, resources are lim uh, the resources are limited, but wants are uh, more. And states are closer to the people. They understand the, they know the pulse of the people. And like you said, they also have, they are also on the delivery front where they deliver public goods and services. So shouldn't the states be allowed to manage its expenditures the way it wants to? Most certainly. And states are allowed, you see, if you remember the days before you guys were born, you would not remember what you had read in history, 1970s and 80s, uh, up to early 90s. For everything the state has to do, you have to go to Delhi. The number of visits senior officials made to Delhi for meetings on a daily basis is a fairly good indicator. On any given day, there would be about half a dozen to dozen senior officials of a state government on their way to or back from Delhi in order to attend some meeting or other relating to some budgetary item. So there was really no autonomy for the states. There was no political autonomy because the governments could be dismissed at will under Article 356. There was no legal autonomy. Many bills were held up by the governors, partisan governors, uh, much less so now. Uh, and uh, the state legislature felt uh, completely stymied. And there was no administrative autonomy because for everything you required the approval or clearance of somebody. And there was no fiscal autonomy because resources were inadequate and whatever was transferred was non-transparent. There was no system. A very, very arbitrary, like you know, income tax, 80% or 85% some year. Central excise, 40%. Why that? Why this? God knows. So it's all arbitrary. Now there's a predictable flow of resources, non-arbitrary, transparent. Finance commissions have done a grand job. And out of the total tax revenues of the union government, 41% or 42% are transferred to the states in a systematic way. And while some states may complain, because you know, always the states which are relatively better off, they complain saying that we are paying more and we are getting less. But that's the nature of democracy. The richest people pay more by way of taxes. The poorest people require help from the government. So you can't have the cake and eat it too. If it applies to individuals, that applies to regions, that applies to groups of people, castes and yeah, socioeconomic groups and so on and so that requires that applies to regions and states that's the logic of it once we're in the common market we would accept a formula which is fair and reasonable because if one part of india economically declines the whole of india is adversely affected let's remember that if up and bihar economically collapse let us say the rest of india will not be in a good position at all because the india is indivisible people can move anywhere Therefore, unrest or unhappiness or abject poverty or mass migration from or to any part of the country affects everybody. If we isolate ourselves completely and think of ourselves as separate nation states, that's not a good idea. Because India gives us the benefit of common market. India gives us the benefit of common defense and stability politically and economically. And if so, there is some amount of price to be paid, as long as there is fiscal autonomy, as long as there's political autonomy, as long as the states can determine their own destinies, we should not complain. Therefore, resources are always a problem. But more than raising resources alone, that's important. And Government of India has done an admirable job. Uh, this year, for instance, significant deployment of resources. And over the years, they came up with service tax, and now it became GST, and so on and so forth. But the states have to also figure out, particularly through local governments. See, if you don't empower local governments, if you don't allow them to raise resources, particularly in urban local governments, you are not tapping the resource potential. And people will not be happy to pay taxes unless they feel they are in control of how the expenditure is incurred. That means local empowerment. And the states are very unwilling to empower locally. They are demanding autonomy at the state level quite rightly. But they are holding on to power at the state level without transferring that power to local governments. And local governments are schools for democracy. So what's good for the goose is good for the gander too. You can't make one argument at one level, another argument at another level. So it's a very complex issue, 
and uh, it's a good thing that we compete, we argue, we debate, but ultimately we all come together, there's an acceptable formula. That's the way democracy works. We should not be unduly perturbed by that. Sir, uh, last year our Honorable Prime Minister made a remark on ravedi culture. He said that the, ravedi cult the, the expenditure on ravedis have been increasing and since then states have been under the scanner for their expenditure priorities. What do you have to say about that? The Prime Minister's concern is shared by many, many people in the country. Because there is a perception that increasingly we have become very profligate. The short-term electoral considerations are dominating in our economic uh, decision-making. And uh, in any democracy, let alone in a poor country, there's always a clash between the short-term benefit that you get from the electorate in the form of the world by giving today something tangible. And the long-term good that you have to promote. Almost always, long-term good is at the cost of short-term sacrifice. Even in a family, if you want to build the future of your children, today we have to be willing to sacrifice a little bit, save a little bit for the future, for a rainy day, or for creating assets, or income earning capacity, and so on and so forth. That's what all good families do. And India is full of good families because there's a country where the family culture is very strong. The same thing applies to the governments too. However, we are a democracy. Unlike in a family, the readiness to sacrifice for the neighbor is less in case of the nation. In a family, my own brother, my own sister, my own father, my own mother or grandfather is no the genes and the bonds of love and affection and long association. Therefore, the sacrifice coefficient, if there's something like that, is higher. In a society, it's bound to be lower. Ultimately, what is great leadership, Mahatma Gandhi and others, they made us look at the society, the larger entity than ourselves, and they made many people more willing to sacrifice. That is the hallmark of great leadership. But it requires great leadership to make people willing to sacrifice for the others. Therefore, it's always a greater challenge in case of a society. And unless we balance both these, we have a problem. The Prime Minister probably is a little impatient. I can respect and understand that impatience, but in real politics, you have to balance both. There's no question of giving up on short-term welfare. A, people are suffering. It's a moral challenge. If somebody is starving today, if somebody is in difficulties today, we cannot say, I'll build tomorrow, but today I'll ignore your starvation. <clears throat> but to be fair to the governments, at particularly at the union level, but also in the states, they are taking care of the short-term needs. For instance, 81 crore people are getting free food grains right now. Earlier, during COVID time, they got 10 kgs per, uh, per month per capita. And today they're getting 5 kgs, but free. So they are taking care of the short-term needs. Today, nobody says there is actual starvation in India. Yes, malnutrition because of inadequate uh, balance and, and food, etc. But in general, starvation deaths, which are so common in the country, is no longer part of Indian ethos, largely because democratic governments have acted sensibly over time. That's what Amartya Sen, for instance, argued, how democracy works. So I think there has to be a greater balance. Remember, even in a rich country like France, it's always difficult to make people sacrifice a little bit for the future. President Macron is trying to make the workers in France agree to a 64-year retirement age as opposed to 62 years today on an average. Whole of Europe has 65 years or more. French people are resisting, they're coming under this, it's very Indian. Unlike many other European countries, French people are very Indian in their protest. The trucks come onto the streets, they block the roads. Rasta Roko is very common like India. So it's a rich country. So what is the lesson? There is an unwillingness to sacrifice for the future. Even if the economic reality stare you in the face, people resist it. Therefore, we have to have a balance. And I think what the Prime Minister is urging is let's have a balanced approach because the Government of India has many short-term welfare measures. I listed some of them today, from LPG to uh, Jandhan program to um, Prime Minister Hawa Yojana to PM Kisan uh, to a whole lot of other things, 81 crore poor people getting the food and so on and so forth. So it's not one or the other. But do we have a balance or not? If we merely focus only on the short term without building the future, infrastructure, investment opportunities, job creation, skilling of people, better quality of education, better health care to enhance productivity. If you don't focus on these, eventually the country will remain in perpetual poverty. Uh, so picking up from two points that you made here, you said uh, the, the answer lies in a balance between the short term and the medium term and the long term. And then you've also, uh, you listed a few uh, the programs that the union government runs for the immediate needs of the people. 
but uh, taking the debt uh, debt component of the states and the union the frbm limit for the union government uh, for the state governments is around 20% and their existing debt gdp ratio is about 31.2% well higher than the limit uh, but for the union also it the limit is 40% but it is 60% or, or near about 60% isn't this kind of a, an, an unfair situation where the states have been disproportionately scrutinized you are absolutely right as i said before what's good for the goose must be good for the gander also Uh, the union government must exercise responsibility as well as the states except that in the short term context union government has a greater problem i'll tell you how you take the current year's union government revenues last year was it was even no but let's take the current year, that is the coming year the budget estimates presented for 23 24 fiscal year out of the gross revenues are 33.61 lakh crores transfer to states interest and establishment cost they together account for 35.93 lakh crores that means the government of india without spending 1 rupee out of discretion or 1 rupee even on fuel or electricity in the office it is incurring a deficit of 2.32 lakh crores what i would call a structural deficit for our purposes mm. for the discussion so it can't be addressed overnight actually it's an impressive thing that the government managed it compared to last year last year if i remember the number was 5.61 lakh crores when we took last year's gross revenue and the expenditure on these three heads namely the transfers to states the salaries and pensions establishment cost and the interest payments on which the government has no control presumably it probably has a control if it uh, applies its mind over time centrally sponsored schemes and other things we can uh, see if there's a uh, different way of structuring them but as of now there's no control last year deficit was 5.61 lakh crores so government of india has as i said a structural deficit you cannot say the same thing about the states because of a significant transfer of resources to states the better off states have significant resource base and the poorer states get significant transfer from the union government on account of both these factors they don't have structural deficit of this kind and therefore there is a greater ability to handle uh, the finances of the state if you are a little frugal if you are a little careful if you look at the long term a little bit but having said that i think any fair examination demands that we treat both the union and the states equally maybe once we in order to set this right it may take a little longer for the union because of structural deficit but eventually we must all agree on one basic principle today if we take the debt gdp of government of india as it is about 60% or more states should be 20% it has now shot up to 55% plus in case of punjab uh in several other states like rajasthan west bengal andhra pradesh is all 38 40 45 in the upper 30s or 40s uh, things are pretty um, alarming i think i should use the word alarming now because if you don't wake up now and set the course right it becomes unsustainable and therefore we have to have a framework without going into revenue culture or union or states who who is right who is wrong i think we must have an absolute time frame in which we will come to revenue deficit being zero we have been having a fiscal deficit norm uh, for whatever reasons the government deleted the revenue deficit norm from the frbm act but i think in order to have a fair and uniform regulation of public expenditure to ensure prudence the best yardstick is are you spending for the current expenditure borrowed money no family borrows money in order to meet their electricity cost on a day to day basis or their transport costs or their food cost it has to be spent from the earnings if you borrow to meet the current expenditure day to day expenditure then that's a danger signal that's a red flag because you are burdening your children with debt for something you are consuming today but if you borrow in order to build for the children say i build a house i buy a flat or i buy a business or establish a business which hopefully will generate income for the future that is perfectly all right because without borrowing you cannot really build a future in a poor country but if borrowing is for meeting the current expenditure common sense tells us that's very dangerous i think therefore both the union and the states must come to this basic understanding without going into micromanagement if the state wants something 
It's for the people of the state, the electorate to decide because state legislature is supreme in so far as the state subjects are concerned on the seventh schedule. The state governments are supreme in so far as the expenditure and administration of the states and the seventh schedule are concerned. I don't think Delhi should interfere on a day-to-day -day basis. It's wrong. But on one fundamental issue, Delhi has a duty, has a responsibility to take care of its own finances and ensure discipline in the state's finances because the constitution makers, Baba Sahib Ahmedkar and his colleagues, they anticipated this. Please remember, states do not have bankruptcy provision in India. States cannot default. Only the union. It's actually, for convenience sake, we're talking about union and states. It's a general government debt. And the ultimate guarantor of debt in India is the union government. That's the reason why under Article 19, uh, 293, the constitution makers made elaborate provisions. Any debt incurred by the state, you must take prior approval of the government of India. And government of India can impose such conditions as are necessary in order to maintain, maintain fiscal rectitude. Not interfere in day-to-day -day administration, but the broader issues. And therefore, in that context, that you cannot borrow to meet the current expenditure is a perfectly legitimate thing. Anybody with common sense beyond politics and parties would agree with that. I think we have to have some such formulation rigorously enforced. And we have to have some mechanisms to make sure that the, the, the whole issue is transparent. Today we are talking in the air. The numbers are touted, you know, they are fished out to, out of nowhere. And then we talk very casually. No, we require a credible, independent, impartial body with professional expertise that goes into numbers and gives us credible data. Otherwise, what are we talking about? We are talking in the air. And based on that, we must have this one central principle. You cannot borrow to meet current expenditure. In case of a war or something, we can look at it. War or extraordinary national calamity. I mean, in India, there is no national calamity as such. There are local calamities. Sometimes we declare them as national calamities. But the whole country is affected by earthquake. In India, it will never happen. Hopefully, our geography doesn't make it happen. But war, hopefully, it will not happen, but it could happen. But otherwise, you must never borrow for current expenditure, period. Sir, it would be an MS of me if we don't talk about OPS when discussing public finances. So we know that many opposition uh, parties are going back to the OPS. And even in Maharashtra, uh, the BJP government and Mr. Shinde's uh, Shiv Sena-led government said uh, they are not negative about OPS. So my first question is, why are, this, why are the states going back to OPS? Vritti, first let us understand what is this OPS business. Because not every viewer may be familiar with this jargon. India is the only large country. I want to emphasize this. India is the only large country in the world which has unfunded, open-ended, index-linked, long-term legal liability of pensions to government employees and only to government employees. How many are there in government out of the total workforce? Roughly about 3 to 4 percent of the total workforce of India is in government. 90 percent of the workforce, 90 percent plus is in an unorganized sector, not only private, unorganized, without a monthly secure wage. They are leading lives of great desperation, eking a precarious livelihood. Elsewhere in the world, pension, when they talk of pension, they talk about all the workers in America, 97.6% of the people get pension. That means all people practically, a small number of unorganized workers don't get it. So is the case with Western Europe and advanced countries. So the word pensions in those countries is different from pensions here. In India, pensions basically means the government employees are on a pedestal. Same work somebody else does. After all, if all of us don't do work, who is producing food in India? Who is giving us this bottle, this watch? This telephone, these glasses, this paper, it is the ordinary workers of India. These workers, there is no security. There is no future. But government employees, because they happen to be in government in a with a colonial mindset, they are put on a pedestal. They are not only paid higher wages than the market and average, but unfunded, long-term, legally mandated, index-linked liability. Index-linked means the pension keeps on mounting. There are people who retired with 10,000 rupee salary, they get 50,000 rupee pension. Now, this is the backdrop. 
and thus taking away the large share of the cake. Vajpayee government understood that this is not sustainable. I will tell you how it is not sustainable. In some states, some good work was done. A thorough study was done. In Andhra Pradesh, for instance, they found that the pension burden now is 16%. If you embrace the old pension scheme of the kind that was prevalent until 2004, which now some of the sections of the employees are demanding, some states are now yielding to that, it would be 39% of the revenues of the state, of the total revenues, including Government of India transfers. Today, the salaries and pensions, they constitute 74% of the state's own revenues in Andhra Pradesh. It would be straight away 129% of the state's own revenues, salaries and pensions alone. That means state's taxes are not enough to meet even salaries and pensions if OPS is embraced. The burden will not be felt tomorrow. The burden will be felt from 2035 onwards. I will come to that later. The debt today, Andhra Pradesh debt to the state is, as opposed to the 20% norm for the states, is now already 38% plus. It will become, over time, over decades, 211% of the GSTP. That means double the state's total income will be the debt with the old pension scheme. The fiscal deficit, that means the amount of money you are borrowing every year is 3% or thereabout today of the GDP or GSDP of the state. It will mount to 11% only because of old pension scheme. But this burden is borne by the whole state. It will collapse. Every state will collapse. I guarantee you. Some states a little sooner, some states a little later, depending on the current status. That's all. But this collapse is going to happen 15 years later. Probably from 2035, 36 or something. Now, we live in a world where life does not exist beyond 10 minutes. In social media, they say beyond 10 seconds. <laughs> People get bored if you and I answer a question for more than 30 seconds or something. Therefore, we are not able to anticipate our children's future. Now, my generation is a passing generation. For you, you may think 15 years is a long time. I can assure you, it goes off in a jiffy. By the time you realize, I'm sorry to tell you that <laughs> at this young age, you will be suddenly in your 30s. That's the way life is. Even now, in my mind, I can imagine that I was just a 24-year-old young officer who joined government. I was a decent nice age at 30, etc. But the truth is, about more than 40, 42 years have elapsed since then. So that's how life moves. So while 15 years appears very distant future today, it's not that distant, it's real, it's imminent. Now, what is the new pension scheme or national pension system? Vajpayee government understood this danger. We must really be grateful to him. He was, I think, an 80-year-old man at that time. So he had no future personally, but he genuinely cared for the future generation. This is the hallmark of great leadership. That you don't do something for today, but you actually think of 20 years, 30 years, and well after your passing. And he quietly brought all the states and all parties together and came up with it national pension system. What is national pension system? It is a funded pension. That is the key. Defined contribution. The employer and the employee, in this case the government, makes a contribution today. So whatever you will be spending 20 years, 30 years later, you are not simply making a declaration and a law today and leaving it to next generation's tax money. You are actually providing for it in a fund today. That is what all countries do, except India. So he brought India to the mainstream. That whatever pension you pay, it's up to the government and the budgetary constraints. But whatever you're going to pay, you're providing for it today, putting away in a fund, you don't touch it, and pension is drawn from there. That is the way the rest of the world operates. And that is the only way if we care for our children. All the politicians who want their votes and who want to win 1% vote today, they're terrified that they will lose 1%, they will lose the election in our first pass the post system. I plead with them. Would you do it to your children? Would you burden your children with a decision that would cost them crores and crores of rupees that they cannot afford because you want to enjoy something at perks of office today? If you don't do it to your own children, how can you do it to the children of India? Our children of Maharashtra? Maharashtra has not yet done it. I hope it will not do it. But because you mentioned Maharashtra, I mentioned it. But other states have started doing it already. Punjab, Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, West Bengal never entered this stream. And sadly, 
you can actually see a correlation between a state's um, fiscal profligacy, that means the finances are in a bad way, and the reckless decision of the old pension system. I'll give you numbers. You take, for instance, I have some data here. Take, for instance, some of the states that are embracing the old pension system. Punjab already is spending only on salaries and pensions and interest. This is committed expenditure which you cannot control, you cannot reduce. Already is spending 168% of its own revenues even now. Even now. And if you take the total revenues including government internet transfers, Punjab is at 83%. Rajasthan, 134% of their own revenues. And from government of India transfers have include 75%, 74%. Chhattisgarh, 115% of own revenues. West Bengal, 174% of own revenues. So already they are in a deep crisis. And recklessly for short term political benefit. And what is the benefit? The 1 or 2% employees votes may matter in a first past the post system. If you cannot persuade the people, what is leadership? Leadership is reconciling conflicting interests. Here, the interests of settled workers in government, relative to the rest of India, already well healed, well protected, secure workers of India, versus the rest of the 98% of the population of India, the taxpayers of India, and the children of India. If a government cannot persuade the people that we must take care of our employees, no question about it. But we must more importantly take care of the people of India. Government is elected by the people of India, for the people of India. And it's sustained by the taxes paid by the people of India. Government is not for the employees and the politicians, not by the employees and politicians, and not of the employees and politicians. We have completely inverted the democratic logic. And because the people, Ordinary people, they don't understand the numbers already by now, they would be bored with our discussion. What are all these numbers? 168%, 174%, 85%. It's all too confusing and too difficult. This is the challenge of a democracy. Many great um, thinkers and philosophers said, reform in a democracy is a very hard thing. Because the vocal and powerful sections who understand what they will lose by the public good, by promoting public good to reform, they resist fiercely. They have voice. They drown out all others. And the multitudes of people, they are busy with their own lives. In a country like India, most often they are not well informed. They are not even told what is the truth. They may be illiterate mostly. They are reeking out precarious livelihoods. Therefore, they have no understanding of what is at stake. So for a reforming, for a government, there is a voice here strongly felt and these fellows, 1-2% vote I may lose, but 98% for whom I am fighting, they don't shout on this issue. Therefore, it's tempting and easy to yield to this. But at what cost? It's not a minor cost. At the cost of destruction of the future of this country. I am not given to hyperbole. I am not saying this for effect. It is the truth. I can absolutely guarantee, if you revert to the old pension scheme, unfunded pension scheme with long-term legal liability index linked, those states are going to see destruction, therefore India is going to see economic destruction, there is no future left. 2004, already we went back, we went to the national pension system, contributory pension. It's worked very well for 18 years, except in West Bengal, which never accepted this quite unwisely. Now, after 18 years of hard work, just wait for another 10, 12 years, our children are secure. All the tax money is there for the future building up of the economy. When we are this close, you now are extracting defeat from the jaws of victory. You are giving up the future of our children for no good reason. And me winning elections and becoming MLA is not a good enough reason. I am absolutely certain about it. Protecting the future of our children is a good reason. Me becoming MLA or Minister or Chief Minister at any cost is not a good reason to make such long-term economic decisions. It's not only morally wrong, I believe it's also constitutionally questionable. Can this generation burden the future generation, not funding it today, but asking them to pay later legally? Even that is a question. No, no country on earth does it. India is the lone exception. It's an absurd thing. It's a dangerous thing. It's an economically destructive thing. 
I hope wise councils prevail and I hope government of India will discharge its statutory obligation. It's for the states to decide to go to do whatever punishment they like. But it is absolutely right and reasonable for the government of India under Article 293 to say, whatever expenditure you are committing for the future, provide for it now. So you show the pension fund, put away that money today. If you have that money, if you are willing to spare that money, if the electorate is happy with this, sparing that money for that at the cost of other development, it's perfectly all right. If people of the state say, I don't want any further welfare, I don't want any development, put away all this money for the future pension, it's a state's choice, it's a political choice the states make, that is what this autonomy is. But you have no right to make, the, make it obligatory for the next generation to pay for the decisions you make today. I think that's the right approach to deal with this. Our conversation today has, of course, established that the macroeconomic stability of the country is important, which would come from the states, in fact. So how can we nudge the states to behave in a fiscally prudent way? And how can we amplify Odisha as an example? I think it's a great question. You know, people say rich states can manage, but poor states cannot. What is uh, by any standard is one of the poorer states, one of the underdeveloped states. Odisha is a model of fiscal management. I'm, earlier I mentioned to you, for instance, the uh, committed expenditure. That's a good indicator of what's happening. Orissa has 77% of the own revenues and only 40% of the total revenues are committed expenditure. Orissa did not embrace all this populism. Orissa is in the forefront of population control among the poor states. Its birth indicated birth rates and fertility levels are now on par with Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, and of course Kerala, the best in the country. It's in the forefront of your uh, power sector reform, in the forefront of education reform and health initiatives. I'm not talking of this party or that party. I'm not related to any Biju Janta leaders. I never met the chief minister of that state or anything. But the truth is truth. Numbers speak. Numbers speak. So it's possible to protect the future of the state, to be politically popular and significant and do what is fiscally prudent all at the same time. It's not true that you have to do one or the other. Do you have the guts as a leader? And do you have the sustaining power? Do you have the perseverance? And do you care for the people adequately or not? I think that is the yardstick. I don't believe that there are objective conditions that force you to do the wrong things at the cost of the future generations. I don't buy that argument at all. So I want to go back to a point that you made earlier. You said, uh, so recently after the budget was released, the Telangana government claimed that it contributes more to the union government that it received in the union in the, from the budget. Uh, other states also like Tamil Nadu, uh, they made similar claims. What do you make of that? Is this, is this fair federalism, uh, to be honest? <laughs> See, as they say, beauty is nice of the beholden. Federalism also, it's in the eyes of the, where you come from. In one respect, for instance, northern Indian states, they can complain that we are bearing the burden of national defense and terrorism. In general, if you're a border state, Punjab, Gujarat, uh, the, the Chinese border, uh, Uttar Pradesh, and Uttarakhand, and uh, northeastern states, they bear the burden of national defense. Therefore, the sacrifice, the pain, the uncertainty is there. Weather-wise, some places good, some places bad. Earthquakes, you see only in Himalayan belt, but not in Dakkan. Coastal, the peninsular India has the privilege of the coastal thing, and therefore long-term trade relationships and so on and so forth. And therefore, there's a culture of economic growth. Landlocked state don't have the privilege. So, geographic variations are inevitable. We are a subcontinental country, multilingual country multi-religious country, the world's most diverse nation on earth. And unless we are willing to make some adjustments to suit the requirements and see that the whole nation rises, there will be regional inequalities up to a point. But if you allow the regional inequalities to go beyond a point, it will hurt us as a country. If Bihar and UP perpetually stay poor, if there is mass migration from Bihar and UP to the rest of India, you can see political instability and social instability. Migration is necessary. But if the numbers go beyond a point, again, you see politics and society and interplay. Similarly, if you think that large pockets of India can be poor and the rest of India can progress and become rich, we are completely mistaken. We are together in it. 
Just as a rich person pays more taxes relative to income, why are their income tax slab rates? Higher income people will pay higher taxes. If a rich man complains saying that no, I am paying one crore rupee as a tax, after all, my income itself is one lakh rupee. How can I pay tax more than that? Obviously, you will pay more tax and your share of tax also will be more. That's the logic. Everywhere in the world, you have this kind of a graded uh, tax system, right? The slab system where the, the richer people pay higher share of taxes. The whole world accepted. The most capitalist countries accepted it. Why? Because unless somebody pays more because you can afford to pay, how else will you take care of the collective? Here the collective is all regions of India. And Tamil Nadu or Karnataka or Maharashtra or Gujarat and tomorrow on Telangana and tomorrow I'm sure Andhra Pradesh, uh, they will start complaining because they are coastal states, they are relatively better off and uh, their economic growth is a little faster, their industrial base is greater. They have more non-agricultural occupations, urbanization is higher. So they are a little ahead of the rest of India. All of India is moving in that direction. That's what development is. Obviously, their incomes will be higher. They pay more. But look at the benefits. Without a common market of India, encompassing roughly 18% of the population of India, wherever you are, you may be in Gujarat, you may be in Tamil Nadu, your market is not limited to Tamil people. Because you have 1.4 billion people in all of India, there is one common market without any impediments. You can now plan and do things which many other countries cannot even aspire to. Because there is one large country, there is one part of India bearing the burden of defense of India. Now, Tamil Nadu can say, I don't have a problem in China. Why should somebody else uh, be, be subsidized? No. Defense of India is necessary for all of us. Regulatory framework like the Reserve Bank of India, like many other agencies which give us a framework of rule of law and stability and so on and so forth, that's there for all the country. Each state, not only the cost, but also the capacity to do it, which is very limited. So we also get the benefits. We are forgetting that. The United India gives us immense benefits of common market and defense and the voice that is heard across the world. If we are from 40 countries or 30 countries, who is going to listen to us? Now, there's one strong voice to represent 18% of the global population. And for that, the richer people have to pay a little more. And you're investing into your future. And as other states rise, other regions rise, we all benefit. So I don't buy this argument. It's a fair devolution formula. There'll be always this healthy discussion and debate. There'll be adjustment. The formula can be improved upon. I have no quarrel with that. But fundamentally, this formula worked. The Finance Commission transfer of resources is one of the great models of federalism in the world. In my judgment, in the last 25 years, if there's one area where we have dramatically improved its federalism, part of it is fiscal federalism. There's always room for improvement. I have no quarrel about that. But to me, unity of India is sacrosanct because without unity, we will not have in our country order. Without order and peace, there cannot be liberty. Without unity, order and peace and liberty, there cannot be economic growth and investment opportunities. So to me, it's a linear relationship. So this is the price we're paying for the unity of India, for the order in society, and for the liberty, and of course, for the common market. We are not giving anybody anything. We are giving something for our own collective good. So uh, staying on top of federalism, uh, until now we've talked about union and the states, but now let's move to the third tier of the government. In the, in the current budget, they also talked about uh, uh, financing reforms for the urban local governments. Like they've envisaged establishing uh, uh, UIDF, Urban Infrastructure Development Some Fund. 10,000 crores they allocated yes. in the first instance. Yes. Yes. They've also talked about property tax governance reforms and they've also talked about improving credit worthiness of the cities to raise municipal bonds. You've been a champion of uh, local governments. Besides the political and uh, philosophical arguments for strengthening local governments, why do you think that local governments are really necessary? They are schools for democracy. Without that, what is happening is, we discussed earlier the freebies in the short term, uh, welfare impulses dominating at the cost of the long term. But one of the reasons is, in a highly centralized government, I as a citizen do not understand where my tax money is going. I don't understand whom I'm voting for and what's happening as a consequence. There is no link between my vote and the consequences that, that result in good or bad for the family, 
and my taxes and my the services I receive. In the absence of that, how do I make a choice in the elections? Therefore, vote by. In the southern part of the country, minus Kerala and many other parts of the country, let's be blunt about it. I am very proud of our country and our democracy. But if we don't acknowledge some of the failings of our system, then we are being hypocritical. Thousands of rupees change hands to get one vote. One by-election in Telangana for the State Assembly recently cost more than the total cost of the parliamentary election in Britain. It's a disgrace and a shame and a tremendous danger to our democracy. Once you don't understand what exactly the vote does, money, that's determining the electoral outcomes. Karnataka elections are due. I'd been in rural Karnataka last three, four days. The kind of things one hears about what's going to happen or what's happening, I, I, I don't think I need to elaborate that. Next two, three months, you'll see what's happening there. It's a disgrace. If money itself is not enough because major players are equally distributing money, then excessive emphasis on short-term welfareism at the cost of long-term good. Each outbidding the other. Competitive populism is taking over. Again, the economic future of India is in jeopardy. It's a practical issue. And the third, if these two don't work, we always have the age-old Indian schisms, caste, region, religion, language, diversities. We polarize people, you know. If, if uh, language or region or your religion gives you strengths and moorings, they're perfectly okay. But it must be part of coexistence framework. It can't be a means of polarization and dividing the people of this country. Caste is no longer have any, of any value in society. It has to disappear. If you make the caste the primary form of mobilization of the vote in politics, then we are actually reverting back to the Middle Ages. All these are happening largely because there is no local governance. We have the weakest local government structure in the world. I always give the example of the apartment where you know, this office is. What do we do? We pay a monthly fee. We all have elected somebody in this team to take care of the collective needs. And they take care of your parking, your elevator, the lift where it's functioning well or not, your water supply in the house, the watch and ward, and so on and so forth. The moment it doesn't happen, you change the leaders. You holler and protest because you know exactly why you elected them. You know exactly why you're paying the monthly maintenance fee. There's nothing left to imagination. It's not with vague intentions we voted. That's how true democracy works. True democracy is not about Mera Bharat Mahan. It's not about idolatrous patriotism. It's about what's happening to my vote? What am I getting in turn? What's happening to my taxes? Where are the services I'm receiving? If that clarity is there in a substantial measure, democracy is safe. And we have to have that. And in the urban context, it's even more important. No, for far too long, we talked about rural India. I grew up in rural India. I passionately love rural India. It doesn't mean that I believe rural India is the future. Modernization means urbanization. Modernization means non-agricultural occupation. That's the logic of modernization. India is getting urbanized. Some states are already 50% level. Some districts are 60-70% level. Urbanization is inevitable. Therefore, the programs of the kind, earlier we had our idea of Rural Infrastructure Development Fund. Now we are talking about Urban Infrastructure yes. Development Fund. 10,000 crores is nothing but it's a beginning. I'm sure it will escalate. But if we reimagine the village, the urbanization, that's good for the country. If we all think of urbanization to distant cities, the poorest people without skills migrating to distant cities without any social security net, our social support system sits a disaster. Urban poverty has become increasingly painful, increasingly dangerous. And crime is going to rise in urban India because of this. Migration to cities is also necessary, but why should a low-skilled person go to a big city for survival? Where people are, that person can provide the services and survive. But because we made it inhospitable in the locality, small towns, there's hardly any emphasis. Everybody goes to Mumbai or Chennai or Hyderabad or Bengaluru or some other city. And how many people can these cities accommodate? The great cities of the world, New York, you take uh, Tokyo, population has declined over years. They've created other magnets. We are required to create small towns or what exists already as small towns. You must build the infrastructure to a level where everything is on par with big cities so that the low skilled people don't have to migrate to distant cities, eking out a precarious livelihood. At least after the COVID fiasco, first lockdown, what happened? About four crore people were forced to go back to their villages, many of them walking barefooted in the hot sun without even drinking water or food. If that did not touch us as a people, 
if that does not inform our decision making for the future, uh, making a policy for the future in urbanization, then I think it will be a sad opportunity lost. We need to reimagine urbanization, create in situ urbanization magnets by building up small towns so that people with lower level of skills don't have to migrate to distant cities without any social support system. And the high skilled people, anyway, a university professor, a film director, a great sports person, a, a researcher of very high standing, obviously small towns cannot accommodate them. Those skills require to go to big cities. But now we are forcing everybody to go to Delhi and Mumbai and Chennai. We have to reimagine. Abdul Kalam, President Kalam, always talked about creating urban amenities in rural India, basically in situ urbanization. So if we weave that into this pattern and skilling and basic infrastructure in small towns, so the quality of life is as good as elsewhere in the world. And thanks to modernity, your telephone and television and Wi-Fi and Netflix, they are now universally available. Small town or big city. So you only have to make sure that your road, your water supply, your tra public transport system, your uh, stormwater drainage and sewerage, and quality education, healthcare. If even that the governments don't encourage, then why are the governments there? Why are we paying taxes at all? Sir, I think you remarkably uh, simplified the linkages for me. Uh, so, are the, the, the reform proposals in the budget sufficient to, sufficient to fiscally uh, strengthen local governments? Fiscally, no. Because if I'm not mistaken, this year we're talking about some 70,000 gross transfers to local governments, urban and rural. That comes to about 500 rupees per capita at 1.4 billion population. It's peanuts. When you consider the total government expenditure in the country, union and states, uh, union is about 45 lakh crores. Minus transfers to states, probably it's another 20, 25 lakh crores in the states. So we're looking at 60 to 70 lakh crores of expenditure by the government. And uh, overall public expenditure, statistics globally show that India has the lowest share of local governments in public expenditure. China has something approximating 50%. An autocratic dictatorship, a relatively homogeneous dictatorship, is 40 to 50% local government expenditure. 40 to 50% of the public expenditure share. India, a world's most diverse and vibrant free democracy, 2 to 3% also is not there. Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Belgium, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, name it. Every country, let alone the rich countries, every emerging economy and poor countries, even dictatorships and military tyrannies, even they spend more in local governments. So we are the most centralized country in the world. Not right. It's just not right. And we are paying a humongous price. Humongous price. Trust me. I am not a... I'm not one of those uh, uh, romantic people gung -ho about local governments. I know democracy is a flawed system. Therefore, we must have adequate safeguards, accountability norms. I'm all for it. Have ombudsman system, have all kinds of accountability measures, but empower so that the people understand the link between taxes and services and vote and public good. Until you do that, you can never see peace and quiet and genuine economic growth and progress in this country. As you mentioned, sir, that the competitive populism has taken over in the states and the state budgets are due in the coming uh, weeks. So if you were to list the priority areas for the governments that they need to look at, what would they be ensuring that they are able to ensure uh, the genuine welfare needs of their electorate without compromising on the long term future of their state? No, see, infrastructure basic communities are self-evident. I don't want to, and some effort is made, at least infrastructure, at long last, after decades of neglect, India as a country and states to some extent are making an effort. Your roads, your national highways, your railway infrastructure, your electricity grids are improving, though there's a lot of room for improvement further. There's too much of debt in electricity utilities, etc. But on the whole, we're on the right trajectory. Therefore, I don't want to re-emphasize that. But things where we need tremendous improvement, and sometimes you pay lift sympathy but not adequate work, and sometimes you ignore completely. Those I mentioned. Education is first on the list. More money is not required. Unlike many other people, I reject the notion that spending more is better for education. We are already spending 4.2% of GDP on education, about 3.5 something percent on school education, per capita expenditure, per child expenditure 
on school education in some states is up to 90,000 rupees on the Pradesh. Other states 50, 60,000. Some other states may be a little less, but nowhere is it less than 40,000 rupees or so. So this money is quite substantial. Maybe here and there you may need to add something. Real issue is how do you generate outcomes, not how do you spend more money in education. So education is the finance minister's dream in my opinion. You don't have to spend more money, but you have to redesign everything to get better educational outcome. We are among the worst in the world in educational outcomes. We must recognize it honestly. We can do a lot better. We must understand that honestly. Healthcare, we are underspending and we are awfully bad in healthcare delivery. Both. We must definitely increase expenditure. Not to 5 or 6 percent GDP again is a pipe dream. We are now spending 1 percent GDP, both union and states put together. Another 0.5 percent to start with, maybe reach 2 percent eventually. But judiciously spent with public private partnership, with competition and choice, focusing primarily on family health and then improvement of tertiary care because intermediate tier, the hospital based insurance program, government funded. Um, Ayushman Bharat at national level, Arukhi Shri, etc. states, with some modifications that's working. So at the, the grassroots level family care and tertiary care public systems, these are seriously deficient with appropriate things. 0.5% also will bring about huge dividends, ideally 1%, no more, because we can't afford it. I wish we could, I could say rest of the world spends 9 to 10% of GDP public expenditure on health care. India is the only country where we can say with some degree of confidence, spend 1.5% instead of 1%, we can improve significantly. Spend 2%, I am delighted. So what more can the finance minister want in the country, any finance minister, state or union? We are very well placed because we have robust infrastructure and capability. We just have to utilize it. After these two, rule of law. We are in a desperate situation. Normatively rule of law exists. Even the Adani Imbraglio we are talking about, I don't want to go into merits and demerits. Fundamentally, what is the issue? Lack of trust. Inflated um, accounting. Manipulation of the stock market in order to inflate the value of the stocks. Why did that happen? Either the regulators were sleeping at the wheel. Let me be blunt about it. The regulators have been sleeping at the wheel. And there is a very strong perception backed by some evidence that the government is showing favoritism. The government may say it's private sector, we have nothing to do that they are technically right. But in a country where there is no real rule of law and economic fortunes are made by political vagaries, political patronage. And it is in substantial measure true in India even today. In America, you can oppose a president and be a multi billionaire without any consequences. You can support a president and become a pauper if a business fails. But in India, certainly, if you oppose a government of the day, a powerful government of the day, the perception is your business cannot survive or cannot thrive at the very least. Because we haven't insulated economic fortunes of enterprises from the political vagaries. Even at least to that extent we require it. Otherwise, we have seen what's happening. A wonderful budget. A sense of economic boom and confidence should have been there. Animal spirit should be unleashed. Now there's uncertainty in the global markets. Hopefully it will settle down. But sometimes mistakes happen. But now we must learn lessons from this. Not merely from a moral standpoint of view. Rule of law is required from a moral standpoint of view. Forget morality. From a pragmatic standpoint of view. From economic growth standpoint of view. From giving confidence to the investing community. Engendering public trust in the market. You require some basic framework of rule of law in operation, not on paper. And with increasing urbanization, crime is going to grow. So far, social controls have held our society together. Everybody knows everybody else. Now, if I misbehave, what do other people think? What do they think of my family? The family bonds kept it together. But in impersonal society in urban India, crime cannot be controlled by social controls alone. And if there's lawlessness on the street, how can economy grow? Therefore, for economic growth, even apart from the constitutional and moral and uh, democratic reasons, for economic growth, sustained economic growth, high growth, you require some basic framework of rule of law, not on paper, not lip sympathy, but genuinely put in place. The fourth, I would say, is your whole urbanization we discussed already. In situ urbanization as a mega project. If you create the basic communities, including Encouraging, you don't have to always create education, healthcare, provide the land and other things, and create some urban planning. 
private sector will come in. There's a zooming real estate market in India. If there's a feeling that there's going to be urbanization, people flock in and then they buy lands and they plot it and they do all sorts of things and they build. So that will happen automatically. Government doesn't have to do anything. You just create conditions to encourage people to do that. That's all that's required. So if you put in one rupee there, I'm absolutely certain 10 rupees of investment will come in. But put in one rupee judiciously. The fifth thing is agriculture. The agricultural partial reform that was sought to be brought in by the three laws were absolutely sensible. They've been talked about by every government for the past 30 years, every economist, left, right, center. But the moment is polarized, the moment is politicized, sadly, many people took a different tune. But anybody with any degree of honesty, any degree of economic thinking, and any degree of understanding of what happens all over the world in agriculture, they know that all these three frameworks are there universally in all the countries. In India, we debate issues without talking about facts. It's our tutu, meme, rather than what is it that these laws intended to accomplish? If you want to take away the government's arbitrary power to control transport, storage and sale of agricultural produce, who is the beneficiary? The farmer. Your freedom is enhanced in the market. You may or may not get extra market price depending on the market conditions, but government is not forcibly constraining you from participating in the market. If you have a contract farming, and therefore in advance you know the price that you will definitely get, and therefore you can afford to now invest money in the secure knowledge that I'll get this much of income for this much of investment, and it's voluntary, whether I like it or not is my choice. If I don't like it, I'll simply play the market as I please. I may rise and I may fall with the market. Otherwise, I have a stable price. Is it good or not? Predictability in pricing in a volatile agricultural market. If instead of a monopoly of agricultural uh, market committee, state control market committee, if you can sell and buy in any number of places, if there is greater economic freedom and choice, is it good or not? So it's a no-brainer. That's what these three laws sought to accomplish. And it's as if they didn't happen. It's all about the romanticism of the protest rather than the content of the laws and the critique of the laws. It's one of the saddest things where politics has completely dominated and, and, and hurt deeply agricultural economics. Now we must wake up and we must make appropriate compromises because democracy and politics is out of compromise. So that some of the concerns and fears are adequately addressed. But look at progressively into the future. This year, India is selling 22 million, sold 22 million tons of rice. <clears throat> Do you know about 11 years ago, India banned export of rice? At the time when, when I in fact talked about exporting rice and I pursued the matter and then persuaded the government of India, many people, how can you export food grain? As if, you know, some great Rubicon is crossed. Orthodox, but economically illiterate thinking will not take us anywhere. We must be capable of taking advantage of the market. If somebody gives us a better price, sell. If you get it at a lower price or lower, better value, better quality from somebody, buy. That's common sense. It doesn't require genius. That's how for millennia humankind flourished. And in order to penetrate the global markets, taking advantage of vast agricultural land, plenty of sunshine, we must modernize agriculture. We must have supply chains compressed. Retail chains must be allowed Indian or foreign, I don't care, as long as there's value addition and global penetration of markets, as long as the farmer gets the lion's share of the end price. And that's what compression of the global market chains are. In India, everything we try to put it in a, in a confusing mix and come up with all kinds of slogans. When Dunkel Draft came, W2 agreement came, they said Indian agriculture will be destroyed. Pray tell me where are all those critics of W2? So, you know, we, when computers were first were introduced by Rajiv Gandhi, trade unions went on strike saying that India will be destroyed. All the bankers used to go on annual strike. Pray tell me, without computers, where would India be today? So we must get out of this orthodoxy for orthodoxy's sake. Economic thinking based on evidence, logic, and the best practices all over the world, they must inform our decision making. And we must look into the future, not live in the past. So if this much at least is done, a lot more is there. But at least if this much is done, I think this country is safe. Well, I hope and I think Ankit also hopes that the wisdom prevails. Thank you so much for such an enlightening discussion, sir. I hope 
you know, the viewers now get a sense of what exactly is happening with the finances at both the union and the state level without going into, you know, tutu meme, as you said. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Riz. Thank you, Ankit. We will come back again on more such engaging discussions on public finance and budgets. Stay tuned on FDR India. Thank you.